Welcome to Working for Women, the independent women's forum podcast, where we are changing the conversation about women and public policy for the better. Hello, I'm Charlotte Hay, Senior Editor at the Independent Women's Forum. Today I'm here with Rachel Curry, who is an IWF Senior Fellow and the author of our recently released policy focus called Ending Too Big to Fail. This is a really complicated but really important subject. Rachel, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I'm going to start by... I'm going to start by asking you to give us a bit of a history lesson. Just about seven years ago, we were headed into a major financial crisis, the effects of which are still uh, with us uh, today in our economy. Now, part of the problem uh, was a housing bubble, but we also had had, uh, problems with regard to the relationship between government uh, and, and financial institutions. Can you tell me more about these relationships Yes, thanks for having me today, Charlotte. It's always so nice to chat with you. Um, I realize that financial regulatory reform may seem like a rather dry and boring topic amid the ongoing theatrics of the presidential race, but I agree with you that it's a very important issue and it's one we need to get right. While economists remain divided over the, quote, root causes of the 2008 financial crisis, most analysts do seem to agree that our de facto policy of too big to fail played a significant role both in the housing bubble and in the subsequent crisis. When we say too big to fail, we're referring to the belief among investors and government officials that certain financial institutions are so big and or so interconnected that their failure would pose a threat to the entire system. This belief was cemented during the quarter century leading up to the crisis when the government bailed out such firms as Continental Illinois, long-term capital management, and then, as we all remember, in March 2008, Bear Stearns. As you might expect, the perception that certain financial firms were protected by an unofficial, unofficial government safety net distorted the credit markets and allowed too big to fail banks to borrow at reduced rates. For that matter, an economist at the New York Fed has confirmed that between 1985 and 2009, America's largest banks did indeed benefit from lower funding costs because of their too-big-to-fail status. Now, it doesn't take a PhD economist to figure out what's going to happen when the government gives implicit borrowing subsidies and implicit bailout guarantees to large financial institutions. As George Mason University economist Russ Roberts puts it, these firms are effectively, quote, gambling with other people's money, end quote. That's why too big to fail is inherently dangerous and it's inherently unfair, and it's why in the aftermath of the financial crisis, members of both parties wanted to abolish it. Well, now, Rachel, legislation followed the 2008 financial crisis. Specifically, we had the Dodd-Frank Ad uh, Act. How was this supposed to change the relationship uh, and the too big to fail concept? Sure. Well, Dodd-Frank was or is a tremendously complicated law that gave vast new powers and discretion to federal regulators. Because of that, we won't understand the law's full impact for many years to come. You look at a provision like the so-called Volcker Rule, which originally was aimed at preventing federally insured depository institutions from engaging in proprietary trading or trading for profit. However well-intentioned it was, the Volcker rule has become a total bureaucratic mess and a big disappointment to many of its supporters. In terms of ending too big to fail, Titles 1 and 2 of Dodd-Frank are the key provisions. Now, Title 1 designates all bank holding companies with at least $50 billion in assets as systemically important financial institutions, also known as SIFIs. It also gives federal regulators the power to designate non-bank financial firms as SIFIs. Thus far, four non-bank firms have received a SIFI designation, although one of those firms, MetLife Insurance, is now suing the federal government to overturn it. The idea behind Title I is that because of their systemic importance, SIFI should face tougher regulations and stricter oversight to prevent them from failing. Now, as for what might happen if a SIFI were on the verge of failure, that's where Title II of Dodd-Frank comes in. It sets up an orderly liquidation authority outside of the normal bankruptcy process. The purpose of this new resolution authority is to wind down a failing firm without letting it destabilize the broader financial markets. There are obviously many, many, many other parts of Dodd-Frank, but Titles 1 and 2 are the most relevant to the debate of our ending too big to fail. Well, Rachel, can we really say uh, at this point that that Dodd-Frank didn't make anything better? 
Well, Charlotte, the paper I did for IWF focused only on the issue of too big to fail, so it was not a comprehensive analysis of the entire law. I personally think there are some good elements of Dodd-Frank, including its regulation of financial derivatives. But if we're looking exclusively at too big to fail, then the answer is no. Dodd-Frank did not solve the problem, and in some ways, it made the problem worse. Just to summarize briefly the main objections to Titles I and Titles II, Title II of Dodd-Frank, the institutions labeled as SIFIs that I just mentioned under Title I are viewed by investors as too big to fail. As former Federal Reserve Governor Kevin Warsh has put it in a quote, by sanctioning some list of too big to fail firms and treating them differently than the rest, policymakers are signaling to markets that the government is vested in their survival, end quote. Now, it's true that SIFIs face tougher, tougher regulations and requirements than non sifis but they also conceivably benefit from implicit funding subsidies. Speaking of which, the International Monetary Fund has estimated that in 2012, the too-big-to-fail borrowing advantage enjoyed by America's top banks amounted to a subsidy of between $15 and $70 billion. The wow. value of that subsidy, again, according to IMF, was smaller in 2012 than it was at the height of the financial crisis, but it was larger in 2012 than it was in the years before the crisis. And finally, on Title II of Dodd-Frank, supporters argue that setting up a new resolution authority to wind down systemically important financial firms effectively solves the problem of too big to fail. Unfortunately, the details of Dodd-Frank's new resolution authority, the orderly liquidation authority I mentioned a few moments ago, the details show that in the words of University of Pennsylvania law professor David Skeel, Dodd-Frank actually, quote, perpetuates too big to fail. For one thing, Dodd-Frank allows the FDIC to bail out certain creditors of a failing firm as part of a resolution process. And for another thing, Dodd-Frank allows regulators to offset the cost of such a bailout by slapping a surcharge on healthy firms. Does that seem fair? In other words, rather than making banking safer, Title II of Dodd-Frank has created a new bailout mechanism and has increased moral hazard. I would also note, finally, that the list of people who believe too big to fail is still a problem includes former Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke and Alan Greenspan, along with a current Fed governor named Daniel Cerullo, and it also includes President Obama's former Treasury Secretary, Tim Geithner. What does this really mean for the big banks? Does it does it help them or hurt them? I think you've answered this, but I just want to make sure that I understand. Sure. Well, you might recall that in the first Romney-Obama presidential debate, Mitt Romney described Dodd-Frank as the biggest kiss that's ever been given to New York banks that I've ever seen. That may have been hyperbole, but in some ways Romney was correct in, in suggesting Dodd-Frank actually helped America's biggest banks. Um, you know, it's interesting. Earlier this year, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankfein, made quite a candid and revealing statement to an investor conference. Among other things, he said, now I'm quoting, more intense regulatory and technology requirements have raised the barriers to entry higher than at any other time in modern history. This is an expensive business to be in, and if you don't have the market share and scale. In other words, it's getting harder and harder for smaller banks to keep up with the bigger banks. They don't have the... Um, ways in which to comply with stricter regulations through legal big legal teams, and they don't have the resources to do so through its lobbying efforts. Well, I'm going to get down to a different level, Rachel. So what about the rest of us? Uh, sometimes it can be hard to understand how policies of government and financial institutions end up affecting the economy and really opportunities for people like you and me. How are we all affected by this? Sure. That's a great question, Charlotte. And it helps explain why politicians are often reluctant to discuss financial reform on the campaign trail at all. It's just such a, a complicated subject. Um, the short answer is that, as I say, in the policy focus, too big to fail distorts financial markets, it reduces competition, and it ultimately damages economic growth. Um, a moment ago, I quoted, quoted former Fed Governor Kevin Warsh. Um, here's how he described the impact of Dodd-Frank. If the government chooses select firms to be public utilities atop the business of banking, it is very difficult for the other 7,000 banking institutions to lend and compete, and that is an obstacle to economic growth, end quote. Um, just look at what's happened to America's community banks in the aftermath of Dodd-Frank. A recent Harvard study found that between mid-2010 and mid-2014, in other words, during the four years after Dodd-Frank became law, community banks saw their share of U.S. total banking assets fall by more than 12%, and the smallest community banks saw their share decline by almost 19%. 
by comparison, um, Harvard, the Harvard study showed America's five largest banks control nearly the same share of U.S. banking assets as they did in the fiscal quarter before Dodd-Frank's Dodd passage. Um, the, the, the author studies note that uh, their findings appear to validate concerns that an increasingly complex and uncoordinated regulatory system has created an even a more uneven regulatory playing field that is accelerating consolidation for the wrong reasons. Given how, now this is how it impacts you and me, given how important community banks are to farmers, small business owners, and families all across America, it's clear that the impact of policies like Dodd-Frank goes well beyond the financial sector. In other words, it impacts everyday people. Today, Rachel, are we more or less vulnerable, <coughs> excuse me, to another financial crisis? Um, well, the crisis that erupted in 2008 was truly historic, and I think it's safe to say that we're less vulnerable today than we were back then. Of course, there's obviously a great deal of uncertainty in global financial markets right now, given all the turmoil in China and Europe and on Wall Street and elsewhere. No one can ever predict the exact timing, obviously, of the next crisis. For that matter, the true test of Dodd-Frank won't come until the next crisis, but here's the bottom line. Seven years after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, we still have a financial system dominated by massive institutions that are seen as too big to fail. We still have implicit government subsidies going to the biggest banks. And we still have tax and regulatory policies that encourage excessive leveraging and increase the likelihood of future government bailouts. So in short, while it's difficult to compare our vulnerability today to our vulnerability in years past, we're definitely much more vulnerable than we should be. What is the answer to all this? What, what policies uh, could be put in place to create a fairer system and one that reduces the risk of such, such devastating turmoil? Sure. I'll, I'll just go through a, shoe, uh, a few. Um, in the policy focus, I listed four reforms that would, in my view, make us stronger, safer, and more equitable, a more equitable financial system. The first reform would be to change the CIFI designation process under Dodd-Frank. The current process mandates that all bank holding companies with $50 billion or more in assets are automatically designated as systemic institutions, i.e. too big to fail. There are several problems with this. One of them is that the threshold at $50 billion means that plenty of non-systemic banks are getting designated and regulated as too big to fail. That's unfair and it's illogical. After all, why would we want to expand the number of banks perceived as too big to fail? Um, a task force assembled by the Bipartisan Policy Center has proposed raising the automatic SIFI threshold for bank holding companies to $250 billion in assets. Uh, that strikes me as a good idea and one that even supporters of Dodd-Frank might be willing to adopt. I would also suggest eliminating SIFI designations for non-bank firms. As MetLife has painfully discovered, the current system is arbitrary and opaque. In fact, one former FDIC official has complained that it makes a mockery of property rights and of due process. If more and more insurance companies and other non-bank financial firms are labeled as systemically important, the too-big-to-fail problem could easily get worse, and that's something we all want to prevent. Um, another smart policy reform would be to either supplement <coughs> excuse me, or replace Title II of Dodd-Frank, the orderly liquidation authority I've mentioned. Um, and we would replace that with new bankruptcy provisions. Title II may be well-intentioned, but its effect has been to increase moral hazard and create a new bailout mechanism. Um, one way to replace Title II would be to adopt the bankruptcy reforms proposed by the Hoover Institution's Resolution Project, which, which wants to establish Chapter 14 of the U.S. Bankruptcy Code. Um, finally, two more ideas I mentioned in the policy focus would be to raise equity capital requirements for the biggest banks and to reduce debt subsidies in the tax code. This is really a critically important issue, uh, Rachel, and I hope we're going to hear a lot more about it uh, in the year ahead as we prepare to select our next president. Rachel, thank you so much for doing this podcast with me. I really appreciate it. And to those of you who have listened, uh, I thank you for your time. And please be sure to come back to listen to IWF's next podcast soon. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, please give it a thumbs up, share it on social media, or Stop by IWF.org for similar content.